Hi, this is Mark Birch, and today we're going to be taking a look at the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, focusing on Chapter 2, The Search for Mr. Hyde. Chapter 2 is the first of many chapters written from Utterson's narrative perspective, and here Stevenson gives us an insight into Utterson's character through the fun times he spends on a Sunday night. He would sit close by the fire, a volume of some dry divinity on his reading desk, and then go soberly and gratefully to bed. The way in which Utterson usually spends his Sunday night gives us a sense once again of his austere character, as was established in Chapter 1. But this is no ordinary Sunday, having had the conversation with Enfield. He can't even enjoy his Book of Dry Divinity, but um, he's now in sombre spirits. We discover that Tutterson has been in such sombre spirits because of the connection that he's made between the events of Chapter 1 and uh, the will that he retains for Dr. Jekyll. The nature of the will disgusts Sutterson. It's become the lawyer's eyesore. And while he agrees to keep it in his safe, it was actually written as a holograph, which basically means that Jekyll wrote it himself. Utterson hates the will because he assumes that his friend has been blackmailed in order to write it, given that all of Jekyll's considerable wealth is going to be given to Edward Hyde, someone that Utterson knows nothing of. The parallelism within this statement seems to draw our attention to the fact that Utterson's offended in two ways, two mutually connected ways, one professionally and second morally. Utterson's been aware of the name of Hyde since the creation of the will, but this has always been a figure surrounded in mystery, and that's captured here by the metaphor of the shifting insubstantial mists. Hyde as a creature has been impossible for him to see into and to understand. Now Enfield's revelations have turned this figure of mystery into something horrific, something that he knows is associated with evil. Therefore, he is the presentment of a fiend. In order to gain some clarity, Utterson heads straight over to his friend Dr. Lanyon's house. There he finds Lanyon drinking wine, the first indication perhaps that Lanyon's going to act as a contrast to Utterson, given that in chapter one, Utterson was described as having mortified a taste for vintages. Lanyon's personality places him in stark contrast to Utterson. He's red-faced, suggesting perhaps embarrassment or excessive energy. He's boisterous, again suggesting the energetic and loud. And finally, his geniality was described as theatrical, perhaps a euphemistic way of describing him as over-the-top or emotionally excessive. Lanyon and Utterson have been friends for many years, both through school and college, and yet they are very different people. And the contrasts between them reintroduce the theme of duality. However, the differences between Lanyon and Utterson are as nothing in comparison to the differences between the two doctors, Lanyon and Jekyll. Lanyon's a man of reason and convention, while Jekyll is a man of imagination and the unconventional. Lanyon describes Jekyll as too fanciful and dealing in unscientific balderdash not based on rationality. Lanyon describes Jekyll as wrong, wrong in mind, with this anadiplosis suggesting the strength of Lanyon's belief in the moral error of Jekyll's unscientific pursuits. Wood of Estranged Damon and Pythias is a reference to a Greek tale. There was an example of perfect friendship, with Pythias being prepared to die for his friend. Lanyon claims that Jekyll's research is so wrong, he would even have separated these idealised friends.